<laughs> Hello. Oh, it's me again. Oh, just switch the light off. Oh, that's better. <clears throat> Last time I did a blog, I talked about chance. And my the idea that I had was that chance is, and I, it's not my idea really, it's, you know, a lot of people have said this, that chance is a quite a modern concept. And this got me thinking, because my, my daughter's interested in uh, sort of Greek and Nordic mythology. And I started talking to her about it. And I tried to sort of understand uh, I, 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 basically I wanted to know if she knew things that I didn't know and she did and what came what actually then came out of this is that I mean I'm going to call this the, the four fountains of destiny okay so what do I mean by that when we are we all at some point in life we ask ourselves why is this happening to me? What, what what's my life going to be like? Um, is there some something controlling, something sort of controlling or or, or sort of steering my destiny? Um, and a lot of people can get sort of um, I don't know. Some people might go off to India and sort of visit a guru sitting in a in a tree painted orange, and he's been sitting there, you know, like for fifty years. And they'll give him some, uh, I don't know, some some bit of money or some food, and he'll tell them some something what they want to know. I'm not that kind of person, okay? So I'm not interested in destiny. I'm not going to tell you what your destiny is, and I'm not going to tell you what you should believe. So I'm I'm not your guru, okay? But I'm I'm a social anthropologist, so I'm looking at this in a as a as a social scientist. Um, and when I say the, so when I'm, if, if I say I'm interested in the four sources of destiny, I'm interested in understanding how cultures in the last, I don't know, as long as people have existed, have, which on, what, what kind of answers have they given to that question, you know, and, or how, how have they answered that question? And so, um, I mean, obviously, all we can go by is are the, the, the sources or the historic, you know, written sources or archaeological sources that, that we have at our disposal. Um, so I tried to make, I tried to sort of um, ask my, ask myself, what, when you, when you try to answer that question, what is the source of my destiny? What are the possible, how many permutations are there or how many different types of answers could there be to that question when viewed cross-culturally, okay, and cross-historically? And I, I, I reached the conclusion that there are basically four. And I don't, perhaps you can think of other ones that, you know, that I haven't really included here, um, but I think there are four. And I'm going to start with the one that I think is like... Uh, potentially the oldest one which is that destiny so um i think if you look at the the nordic north, north northern europe the nordic people so i don't really know much about nordic mythology that's why i had to ask my daughter and she, so she told me this she basically gave basically gave me the rundown and we listened to a podcast so when it comes to destiny and correct me if I'm wrong, you know, they're probably like, you know, experts listening to this. Um, so she told me, we, we listened to this, um, there's this idea in Nordic mythology of the tree that basically is rooted in the ground. And it, so it's, it's rooted in the under, there, in Nordic mythology, there are three, if you like, three um, realms of existence so there's the underworld there's the world where we sentient beings walk um, and then there is the uh, I think it's called the Orb Orba garden which is the the basically um, above the world the normal world where we sentient beings um, walk and it's where the gods are located and some of the time and um, the tree 
this tree has its roots in the ground and it moves and it, its trunk is in the normal world and its leaves and its branches spread out into the Orba garden of the, the world above where the gods are. And in this tree, so there's this myth that at the top of this tree there are three I suppose we would call them witches, but they're, they're three, let's just call them three women who um, sit at the, there's a, so, and there's also a source. So, so there's this water, there's a strange concept at the top of the tree, there's water trickling out of the tree from a source. And these women are weaving people's or everybody's, um, the thread of their destiny. Okay, so... If I was a Viking, I probably would have believed that, okay, my, the thread of my destiny, what, what determines my, what, what my life's going to look like, is uh, basically determined by these, well, firstly, determined by these three women who are weaving the thread of my destiny up there, sitting in this tree, in the Orbergarden, in your overworld. And um, so... The idea that uh, that my life's going to be sort of there are things going to happen in my life that are just pure chance. I don't think I think that's more or less ruled out by that kind of con conception. And then they they weave my the thread of my life into a tapestry, um, which is interesting because that almost corresponds to the later co to our concept of social fa social fabric. And there is even in social science, there are some social scientists, for example, uh, archaeologists, um, there's this thing called, uh, there's this book by Ian Hodder called Entanglement, where he tries to basically, um, you know, sort of um, construct this theory. It's not really just his idea. I mean, he's obviously influenced by the social scientists, but he, this idea that, uh, you know, causality is not really just like, lineal um, but it's there are all these various things it's it's very Ast aristotelian but i just wanted that more more or less a foot footnote that you know a lot of social scientists are harking back to this very sort of nordic understanding of um destiny and agency and history so obviously if you're a Viking person and you believe in this tree of this tree with these three women, nor I think they're called Norns, sitting at the top of this tree, like weaving this uh, the thread, everybody's th individual thread. Okay, so okay, so are they gods? Well, they're not really gods because Odin is sitting underneath the tree and he is also he's very kind of subservient to these three women. Okay, so even I think even his destiny is being woven by them. And uh, so that's the interesting thing is that the Nordic gods, I don't think they were really very influential in terms of like sort of influencing history and people's destiny. Although there was there was a, a god of, uh, they did have a god of thunder. And obviously when, you know, thunder occurs, things can happen. Um, but I, I can't get into the details of that and to what extent it's sort of contradictory because I don't really know enough about it but um, so my daughter told me something which I thought was really interesting is that when you ask what and you can ask you know what what so who determines is it the norns weaving these threads of individual destiny that uh, are actually making the decisions as to what's going to happen with my life as a Viking, you know, whether I'm going to go across the Atlantic and discover Vinland or go to Sicily and, and you know, become Italian. Um, she said, well, actually, that's a sort of grey area. So the, the Norns are just weaving uh, the threads of our destiny, but they're not actually making the decisions so the decisions as to what happens it's it's all left uh sort of it's 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 not really explained as far as i can as far as we can see so the idea so this this is potentially one of the oldest ideas um of the one the first of the four um 
sources of destiny the idea that it's a sort it's quite literally a source you know like a spring and that destiny comes out of the earth and who knows it's just down there somewhere and we have to and there are these people guarding it and um they weave our threads okay that's one probably one of the oldest ideas now if you move on to the to the greeks um the greeks were much more involved in in influencing the destiny of people okay so if you read the iliad there's this bit this passage in the iliad where zeus i think he wants like to have an afternoon nap and he goes off the street to sleep and he says to his um and the the the, the troy um the wars um what are they called the trojan wars um are, are like going on below and all these people are like trying to kill each other and he but he's very much sort of it's like you know having like a little lego land below you and you can pull the strings so so we're moving on now from the gods being like subservient to some of some other um entity which is like faceless and nameless and sort of mystical the gods Zeus, Zeus is very much sort of um in control but the thing is the the, the greek gods they were very much like people, so I suppose they would have farted, you know, and they would have, um, they had wives and they had all sorts, they did all sorts of things that, you know, people do. And at some point, this is quite interesting because the gods had to sleep. So Zeus goes to sleep and he tells his wife, uh, what was her name, Hera, don't do anything while I'm asleep. Okay, so she also could like influence what's going on down there. And, um, I, oh God, I know that feeling. So, but so he went to sleep and when he woke up, he, it's like, oh my God, what have you done? You know, so obviously the Greek gods did have, they could influence destiny. So if, if we're moving on, like from the, the Vikings who like, oh, well, it's all a bit sort of vague and it's just like a sort of spring of, of, of destiny. You move on to the, to the Greeks and it's all very much, well, it's the gods the gods are deciding a lot of the stuff that's going on okay so you have to propitiate the gods so you have like um you have temples where you go and ask there are, there are mediators um um who uh mediate between people and gods and you ask them questions and you give them some money or some some something or other and they're just gonna you know tell you some bullshit about what um about what you should do and what you shouldn't do so it's like in order to make decisions concerning your destiny like important decisions that might influence the, the rest of your life you you know it's a good idea not to just sort of trust chance <laughs> that chance means good with you i mean they, they wouldn't have had that concept so they they would go to a, a temple and try and influence their destiny in some way and um i've i've included so this is the second source of destiny it's the second if you like way of thinking it's the second um in a sense philosophical possibility that exi that i can see there might be more but this is the second one that occurs to me concerning the, how people can think about their destiny okay so I've included under, you know, the theological um, aspect, this theological aspect that the gods um, influence our destiny. I've included um, Mother Nature because um, I, I very much consider Mother Nature, the concept of nature as a kind of transitory, um, ephemeral kind of concept that is still very much alive. But I don't think it's very much, it's quite, I don't think it's alive in natural science because natural science has more to do with like principles and mathematics and equations and and sort of it, 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 the, the idea of mother nature is very sort of um anthropogenic so it's it's if you like it's a bridge between theological thinking and modern um natural science so you have the, if you look at the old um or if you read the old uh, philosophers philosophers of nature like Schelling he uses this term a lot okay 
um, I don't think he, he calls it Mother Nature, but he, he refers to um, Natur, of, of the, the concept nature goes back to the Greeks, you know. Um, but he uses the term, and he lived like about around 1800 to like in the, to the mid 1900s, um, 1800s. He, he, was, he, he was quite old when he died, and he, he influenced Hegel quite a lot, you know. Um, and so he uses this, this, this older term that he picked up somewhere in the, in the literature, natura naturan and natura naturata. So, so nature is not just basically natura naturata, I suppose it's basically nature as, as an object in, in its like concrete form, like a tree as we see it, or like, um, anything basically what what modern philosophers sometimes call things which I, I can't stand that term um and natura naturans is nature as a process so nature has this duality it's a process but it's also a product okay um and it, that there's almost like a correspondence there um between some philosophers who talk about um, in German the Seinder and the the Seinder, the Sein and the Seinder, being uh, in the sense of existence or, or like an, a higher form of being, being as a, as a general category, which philosophers like Heidegger would have almost like um, talked about in a very medieval way. As almost like a like almost like a, a, um, a replacement god, okay, and um, being as as a thing, something that has become, as it were, and is is being like a human being, okay. So, I so gods and nature for me are basically very similar in terms of explaining our destiny, okay. So um, now, if you if you look at Christianity. This is one of the things when I start that so there's, there's this debate in, in Christianity or in theology about the um, is it the theodicity debate where you know you can ask why if if uh, people suffer why does God allow that to happen so in that debate obviously if if that question can be asked then there is some kind of understanding or, or agreement um, that. God does actually steer things, so he steers our destiny, okay, so there, there, again there's the pr pr propitiation, so if you look at a lot of Christians when they, when they, um, when they actually um, pray, they only pray when they actually want something, so that's a form of pr pr propitiation, and which is basically just asking the gods for something, you know, for your for your help. A lot of people go to Lord, okay, when they when they're very sick, they go to they they drink holy water and hope that it's going to like cure them, or they go on um, pilgrimages where they stop at various points. And obviously, that's, they, they they pray not just for God's well being but for their own well being. Okay, so so that's the second. That's the theological concept of destiny. So destiny is very much um, something that, for for, the, for for religious, for the Greek, ancient Greeks, for Christians, and I think also for like people who believe in Mother Nature as somehow some kind of god-like thing, which re isn't supposed to really be a god. But obviously, if you look at the way they talk about it, it is it, it's conceived as a god. I think all these people very much have a, a concept of their destiny being controlled by an outside force and not by, as we're going back to the Vikings, as something that just like springs out of the ground that we don't know anything about. They certainly, Christians and the Greeks, certainly tried to bring detail into uh, their theological um into their theological theories, into their theology, and you know, into their they they they're trying to like build to to they're not really trying to mystify the whole thing back to a certain like a source where we, you can go that far but you can't go any further, but they're trying to 
round it up somehow into some kind of, um, you know, sort of theory or book or uh, concept that is in that is in itself sort of you know um, isn't contradictory. That's why there is this debate about the, is it um, the the city debate um, about suffering in the world and why it exists. Okay, because you try you're trying to round up the theory. You're trying to get it basically sort of round. Um, you're trying to basically um, deal with the loose edges. So the third, the, so my third. Um, category um, how people in different epochs but I think this is very much a sort of modern idea deal with the idea of agency is that it's up to us okay so there's this German there's this nice German um, word for that oh, come on dog stop it um, there's this nice German word or, or sort of saying um, jeder ist sein Glückes Schmied okay so Schmied is a sh the sh schmied is a smithy and the germans say everybody is basically able to smithy their own destiny okay so this is the, this is basically so this idea is mod is is obviously uh, it's perhaps not obviously but i think generally thought of as something that's post enlightenment um that somehow also very much um very much intertwined with with uh, with the development of social uh, so the social sciences, with historical materialism, dialectical materialism. So that so that um, and perhaps also with German idealism. So that to assert, so that the idea that people are more empowered to influence their own destiny um, is and and other people's destiny perhaps. Is very much, uh, you know, come becomes more important. I, I don't want to linger on that one because I think that's the way most a lot of people think anyway. So I don't have to sort of. I think everybody knows what I mean. And the fourth one is the one I actually talked about yesterday, which is which is the which is chance. So I said that, um, and and I know that a lot of so-called primitive cultures people like african tribes uh, at least at the beginning of the 20th century when they were like living where they didn't have very much contact with um western culture that there is i think it is it evans pritchard or malinowski there's one of these famous anthropologists who describes in detail um how um um africans and people in this african tribe people he studied so they would go across the river every day, and then in, I think it was the Nile. And anyway, the, the Nile is infested with hippopotami, and every so often, the, as chance, you know, sort of dictates for us anyway. At some point, one of them's going to get like knocked off his canoe by a, a hippopotamus, and it's going to be eaten by the hippopotamus. Now, for the wet, so. Evans Pritchard talks about this, you know, quite quite a lot, and he says, "Well, for me, for him, it was just like a matter of of time, just a matter of you know, uh, days or, or weeks before this happened." But when he talked to those people, they said, "Well, well, no. If it happens, it happens for a reason." So this again, this is basically, uh, and what I said yesterday about the idea of the fact that a lot of um, you know, North European um, languages have used used the word chance, and they don't have their own word for that for that concept, which suggests that the idea of chance is a quite is quite modern, and I w I think it's all it's also um, linked to and dependent on the development of mathematical thought. So I mean, for us. The first time you started thinking, I started thinking about chance is probably when I went to school and had like an education. So this, if you, if you, I mean, I went to a comprehensive school, for, you know, for dummies, but um, so, but the teachers, that's one of the first things they taught us, you know, the math, uh, chance, the concept of chance and that, you know, it's like, <sighs> So much of our modern thought is based on the concept of chance, okay? 
um, and not agency. So we've got agency, but we've also got chance. So we're very much sort of caught between the two. Um, so so we can do things. We can change our life. We can go forward. We can, we can be positive. We can, you know, um, make things happen. But the, but shit also happens. OK, so I've, I've, I've so that's the end, basically, of my my ranting and my monologue. And so I talk quite a lot about the first two, you know, so the, I'll go, just go back over them once more. So the, the four sources of of destiny, not in a like mystical way, but in a more social anthropological way, I hope at least this is just like an overview. So the first one was this idea that it's just something that comes out of a, of, a, of a fountain at the top of a tree. It could be like the fountain could be somewhere else in different cultures. They could conceive of that in different ways. The second one is very much that the gods or godlike creatures, godlike beings like uh, Mother Nature and so forth, influence our destiny. The third one is that destiny is very much something we uh, can influence and have like um, that we have agency and that we have like uh, some kind of potency when it comes to our destiny. And the third one is basically it's just chance. Just it can happen or it might not happen. And we basically so I think those people are more likely to just like sit in a sofa all day drinking beer and, and stuff, you know. Um, and the ones who believe that it's it's agency and they can do something about it, they're probably the ones who are doing sort of startups, you know, making loads more money than I am. That's that's it. And if I think of any more kind of details to this rant, I'll leave a note below. Perhaps if you have any ideas, I would be very grateful too. Um, yep, yeah, that was it. Thanks a lot. See you next time.